but it's a system of system already without the cyber part, if you want to think so. But it's already been a cyber physical for a while. Uh, system for a while. So just uh, so we, I get this through this important that I show you the picture of my students. I, this, I tried to summer. So what I did when John asked me to give this talk is that uh, it's a systems uh, department. So I, I thought that I would try to put all the work that we have done within the model-based design framework. I will show you how different parts of my work fit in there. And also gives you an idea of the art. And so the work is about from 2011 to 2016, that's the title there. And it was done in all of these Nordic and EU projects. And it's still ongoing in a couple of PhD projects that are financed by the Norwegian Transmission Network Operator. And I am working in this open cyber physical systems project. It's an idea project. It's coordinated by SAS. And we work with Siemens on the, on the electricity network. Uh, just so now I can tell you who I am. Uh, do you know what this is? Okay. Good. Nobody has any other idea? So it's a hat, right? Or is it a ball that ate an elephant? This is from the, the Little Prince, the book, and it tells you about different perspectives that you look at things. So, so yes, I am an academic, but uh, maybe I can ask you some questions. Do you know what this is? It's a, it's a river, right? Do you know what part of this? What is this? Is the casing to put all the water from the river going down the mountain? I guess I'm telling you the story already. This is a very small turbine, less than uh, like 500 kilowatts, very small. And that's where they're the end of the picture reaches when they're installed then. So why am I showing you this? Because this is where I grew up. My, so I, I um, have any guess where I grew up? <laughs> I know. So okay. Yeah, you can't answer. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> I, I'm from Guatemala. So I grew up seeing this because um, <coughs> you'll see in a second. But as you see, it's a very, very different contrast. And the electricity networks, the distribution looks like this. And it's not that different from India. So my Indian students like this picture a lot. And I show it uh, so we have very, very great diversity in that country, which is interesting. And this is in a farm. It's a 120 kilowatt project. And this is my dad. So I saw this project when I was growing up, and I saw it from the day I started making the foundation to make the dam all the way, the small dam, <laughs> all the way to when they put together. So that's where I really come from. I'm an electrical engineer by heart. So uh, now that I told you this story, I tried to put some keywords here and try to put some context with cyber physical systems. So smart is really actually a generic term for digitalization of different devices. It's the, uh, Context systems and this picture you maybe you have seen it is about how we are going towards the fourth industrial revolution. So it's an interconnected uh, uh, cyber physical systems or Internet of Things they call it also. And the complexity is uh, increasing compared to previous periods. The the interesting thing this is I took it from the the European Commission website where they state that this is a very unique re revolution where we're merging many systems together. So an uh, uh, electrical grid or a microgrid or a normal grid, you basically interconnect uh, uh, different components and you have a level of management. And those levels of management, how you organize them and run them is both uh, technical and it's economical also. Okay. 
and you interconnect generation, storage, consumption, and transport across different voltage levels. Uh, then there is a lot of uh, discussion about autonomous and automatic, and actually I like to make this point that uh, autonomous actually means that you have free choice, but what we actually are developing is semi-autonomous systems, and I guess you're familiar with uh, semi-autonomous aircraft or vehicles like this. And so it's a common word now with the smart grid that we want to make an autonomous system, and that's not possible because the system cannot have free will. So it's important to know that we're developing predefined methods from where the system can choose. Uh, zero net energy is another term that is being discussed, and actually this is a very interesting term if you think about it, because you should be able to uh, consume as much as you are producing, and that would require really a big transition in the technology that we have if you want to have this sort of approach. And what, what to think about society is that you have, can think about autonomy in communities, uh, autonomy in communities that try to achieve zero net energy. So this means that you, they have a choice, an informed choice of how to take actions and how to do it. And the most important thing now, I think, that we have to think about is autonomy the cyber world where the essential freedoms are those that we have the interactions with the technical systems that we're going to be running. So the ability of us to control them is the important factor to think about. So you have two perspectives uh, on this stuff, the hat and the elephant. And uh, the technical perspective is what I can really talk about. So what technology is needed for these sort of called smart grids, which I call cyber-physical networks, really. And uh, then I'll just try to tease uh, some of you of what do we would need to have autonom autonomy in communities or in society at large. Uh, I guess you have seen this picture. Uh, this is from NIST. So uh, this is for transmission. So you can see here how you have, maybe I should put it like this, how you have operations, in the, how you run, they manage the system, the transmission network, you have electricity markets that runs the, the economic part of the system. And you have consumers, so basically you're going from the generation all the way to the consumption, and you have control, you have protection, you have optimization running through the process. If you look at the distribution network, it's not that much different. So the interesting thing on those pictures here is that now you see external communications, information flows coupled to electrical power flows, energy flows. So that's, that's the interesting thing from this picture. The yellow arrows and the blue arrows, those are really the, that interaction between the systems. So an easy way that a control engineer will look at this is that you separate the physical system so you have equipment that can be controlled. You have the, the interconnected system. So you have an actuator that can manipulate and the interconnected number of these uh, components. And the cyber world is the sensors. So the phaser measurement units are very popular in, in my area in the US. Uh, then you have communications and you have digital control systems. And this, uh, this is what the cyber parts really comes into play now with the increase. So you will have different domains interacting with each other. And uh, the cyber system, the cyber part, is what we will need to increasingly use to manage, technically operate, run markets, and uh, other aspects. A very specific example that I will show through the presentation is uh, this wide area control system. It's WAX, WAX for sure. So this includes an ICT platform that merges input measurements, data, transforms them into signals to perform a given technical function. So here you have, um, I think I need my text now. Yes. So you have a number of these units, synchronized pressure measurement units that are taking synchronized measurements at different geographical locations, OK? And you're going to send data through a communication network. And then a computer system that is known as a phaser data concentrator, you will take 
uh, all of the measurements that are taken, for example, 50 times per second, and we look at each of them and align them from the different locations. So you can be, build a, a synchronized snapshot. And then the interesting part is here that at one of these devices, for example, a load, you have a control system that will read its data and you will perform a control function. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that we have three systems. We have the electrical system, we have the cyber system, and we have time. Time is very, very important because it's a system of itself. So you have three interdependencies. So this is a very unique uh, cyber physical system. And what this, just thinking about this nice system, you find out and you look at what we need, we need actually tools to design it, tools to simulate it, and tools to deploy the hardware and the firmware in each of the cyber parts of it. And these tools don't exist in an integrated fashion. So that, I can finish my presentation. <laughs> But uh, so what I do is that I try to work on two specific areas of technology and tools that utilize them. So I will work with sensor networks and modeling and simulation. And these are the core technologies to build simulation-based tools, tools that combine both models and measurements, and measurement-based only tools. And these are used to answer questions. So what we can learn from the past, what actions can we take now, and what actions can we take from the future. So you can learn from measurements, and you can take some actions for a few, even I would say even for a few seconds. But after that, you need to combine both models and measurements to make something happen. Uh, but all of this depends on the basic two core two technologies. And actually that's how I got involved in model-based systems engineering because I ended up having to do that job when I just wanted to do the lower part. This picture tells you what you need uh, uh, in future tools to manage electrical networks, to be able to learn from the past and predict in the future. So the red line tells you what you can do in the past, and the uh, orange line tells you what you can do in the future. And of course, here are two things. Uh, you have an increased opportunity to learn from data as you go into the past. And you have an increasing uncertainties as you go into the future to be able to predict and make analysis. Uncertainties so play a big, big role. And the idea is that if we are here, this tells you different tools that an operator or, uh, or, or the control systems of the electrical network we need. So, for example, we can use short-term measurement-based prediction. Uh, you can use remedial actions, but those need to be the uh, use use a model to write really what action you should apply after something has happened here. And uh, there is a lot of sort of real-time analysis tools that we have built in the field. And in the past, you can do a lot of model value validation, reconstructions. Uh, and this, what I like about model-based uh, uh, systems engineering is that we could address more of these aspects that require to combine models and the sensor that works together. So uh, are we evolving towards this fourth industrial revolution for an electrical grid? So my question is, if the foundation doesn't change, we cannot change the edifice. So, uh, are the sensor networks evolved? Are sort of modeling simulation tools evolved? So this is a blog. I started being an assistant professor in 2010. Just right when you have the peak of popularity for the term smart grid. And now it's 2016, so, well, should there be some lessons or something we can think about, okay? And I want to show you... Oh, wait, what's the blue? And the name? Well, blue, dark blue. Oh, there's people who appear about it. Yeah? Yeah, there's, 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 there's a kids. There's a hex from yeah. South Korea is uh, investing a lot of this. So, two examples of what 
I can show you why model-based systems engineering is the key to the world. So, one is both of them from Europe, one is in Sweden, is the Royal Seaport Active House. And the other one is the smart meter case in the UK. You don't read Swedish and neither do I. So the translation of this is smart fiasco for prestige building in the Stockholm Royal Seaport. So basically what they wanted to do is a home automation system. That's what they wanted to do. Okay. What happened? Uh, they were very, very easy things to solve, but uh, you will need somebody else to do it for you. You could have done it yourself. So they had problems that were easy to solve. And then they had to try to solve the problems with another communication solution, not the ones that they thought they would use at the beginning. So this is very interesting. The product was never tested that never ready to test in the apartment, the product that was deployed. Never tested to be used in the apartment. ABB delivered the functionality in a software on a PC. Okay? So this is what I really like about this report because the, this is um, uh, what, what it tells you about the status of real, the real world. That the companies were not accustomed to work together in a development project. So you had ABB from Sweden, you had Electrolux, you had provides the home appliances, you had the distribution of the operator and a bunch of universities. And they were not accustomed to work together. So the integrated project, the integrated with product was never tested actually. They, well, they deployed a software uh, with a computer and then yeah, lights that. didn't work, things to the other. Very interesting, huh? I have a point to all of this coming. Then, smart meters in the UK, they had a lot of hacking incidents, okay? So before they rolled them out, you have these very clever guys that figure out how to hack them, okay? And then you have questions that were they be worth the money because you have spent a lot of money in some system that would be hard to update. And uh, there were constant delays in the project. But the interesting thing here is that the use of missed approved uh, functions, uh, such as this one, that are considered for stronger uh, authentication are not adequate. And the basic lesson that is learned that you shouldn't create your own uh, cryptography. You know, you should use the one from the expert. So they had spent many years doing this to find out the most obvious answer. And then is the cost. So in Sweden, this cost this costed 181 million crowns. So roughly uh, $200,000. And what you got, the lesson is that the companies cannot work together in a new project. So this is very interesting for me because is that why were these technical failures that are so simple not identified at an early stage? So what you can see here is that there was not an under understanding of user requirements. They couldn't figure out how people behave and what the requirements were. They didn't have a system of systems design approach. Okay, so they couldn't even speak speaking the same language to do the project together. So a common language. Product integration and deployment without testing and verification. So, <coughs> and here we have two domains that were released together into the wild. The instrument, the measurement instrument, and the communication part. Together you put them into the wild and what happened? Security requirements and meter requirements were not done together. So you cannot develop a solution that way. Right? Uh, meter experts perhaps are not security experts, so perhaps they shouldn't design a new <laughs> encryption. And you have people not working in the same framework. So these are two real cases that tell us that uh, why is it so hard to do a system of systems 
the side. Is it really that hard? And my answer is no. This has been proven. Boeing has been doing it for years. So they had this design engineer revolution, and this design re engineer revolution is actually the model based design approach to develop a new product or system. Yeah. This is a slide that John Barris was using. Okay. Uh, I have a prettier one next. No, 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 no. I mean, if, if Bob solved all their problems for the bottom 777, seven, seven, which is what you're kind of hinting at, like, not all of them, but they learned. Right. Why did they have so many problems for the 787? Well, that's because the electrical engineers were the last ones to jump on the, on the model based design approach. That's my easy conclusion. But I, 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 of course, don't know, but there is. Well, I want to point out that there is some things that we can learn from the approach. Oh, sure. And that's what I want to highlight in this slide. But to claim they solve all the problems that's an overstretch. But this is a new one. Now I'm not making that claim. They make more problems, like new ones, because yeah. now you, you have to figure out how to work together. That's much more hard. So I like very much this uh, report from uh, Boeing that is called Simulating Success. So you have all of these different tools that you can demonstrate how to go all the way from design to manufacturing. And these are the things that I picked up that are very relevant for the smart grid part. And the idea is that we can really learn a lot from what they have done for the smart grid. So you have product or system testing, training systems and maintenance, and you have network communications. How does this help? Well, you can test prototypes in a variety of environments before you deploy it obvious, but it's there. You need to train users in this case, needed to be trained in the environment. Okay? Uh, and the interesting thing is that you reduce simulation costs very, very high. And then the, for the network communications, which is very relevant if you think about the wide area controller, is that the scale of the network is very, very prohibitively to test, or maybe it's even impossible because you cannot perturb the system in that way. So uh, the, the way to do this in laboratories is, is, is a, an approach that we could adopt. And simply put, if you have seven, uh, how, how many it was? I don't remember how many, but you can see all of the different, different suppliers that needed to be involved to make this product. In the previous two examples, there were three or five parties only, and it was a whole automation system. So I think there are some very, very good approaches that we need to adopt in electrical So power. this is 777? This is the new one. 787. But they still have problems with the battery, remember, in this one. Yeah, but that's the least of their problems. I mean, they completely, completely changed the supply chain. Okay. Between the 777 and the 787. Completely changed it and ran head on into some much, much more difficult problem than I think they were ever anticipating. So to come yep. and claim that they solved all these problems with the 777 is just not true. Like, right. even the John Barrett say this, okay? It's no, no, I'm not claiming that. I'm claiming that the plane flies. No, 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 no. but I put the delays and... You know. But the plane flies. We don't have a smart grid. Yeah. You see what I'm trying to get at? I keep going. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, we did this one. Okay, so this is the, the model-based engineering approach, and now I can tell you about some of the things, because the talk is about challenges and foundations, so I can show you what we did and where we are stuck. So as you know, in this part, we have multi-domain model integration, uh, where you need the physics of different domains, and actually I work on, the, on this domain, and right now we're working on the mechanical domain also. With Siemens. We're trying to understand each other. And you have these uh, levels of abstraction that you have to keep. And the very interesting thing is how you can go and exchange st uh, structured behavior and information through uh, UMF. And this is very relevant now, at least in Europe, for electrical grids. Because you can, in some way, have a uniform, a unique uh, model from where you can derive simulation models. So uh, I will try to uh, use this picture. I know that John Barrett doesn't like this one. 
And all of the stuff here, I'm putting it on the left hand side here on top. So uh, when, when I talk about how, what we have done here, you can think about if we were trying to design a controller, because that's when I will show you how we go through different phases. And the difficulties on all of these different phases that we work in, in the model based design approach. So the first uh, example is the use of the smart grid, uh, arch, uh, scan, smart grid architecture methodology. And the interesting thing about this is that it provides for the first time a way where different uh, stakeholders of, of the system can actually make a joint use case and a joint architecture design of the system. This uh, doesn't ha didn't happen before. You have the electrical power engineers doing all of the electrical engineering, and then you have the com guys on the other side. So this is being used in European projects to start from a use case and the right actors and scenarios and define the architecture. So uh, in this example that we have here, we have a distribution system, a transmission system, and here you have a monitoring application that you will see later, and the use case was to be able to uh, detect the stability, voltage stability of the system, integrated system, and which one, which part, transmission or distribution, was responsible for the effect. And to do that, you need to uh, create a component layer where you have these phaser measurement units, uh, submitting information to different parts of the system. And you have a communication layer where you have a lot of different protocols involved in this process. So this is a very nice way, way of understanding and seeing that you have multiple actors from the process and the field, the station, operation, enterprise, okay, to do a simple task. And this complexity, we, we, it was not easy to rationalize it. So this was one of the first use cases that I will show you later on. So, uh, yeah, so I mentioned already. Okay, information modeling and exchange uh, in Europe, because uh, I'm not sure if this is happening now in the eastern part of the US, but we have something called the Common Grid Modeling Standard, CGMS, which is based on IEC, uh, international standards that use UML. So uh, our system model can, provide, uh, can be provided using this technology and you can get the behavior, structure, parametrics and requirements from it. However, the tooling has very limited support now to use this. Uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you know, but uh, the, in the case I work with dynamics, so I want to have differential equations defining my models. And in this case, this is given in this profile. So if you get a model in UML, you can actually get the connectivity of the network, the definition of what components are in there, the topology under which you're operating, values of uh, some states. And you can also get the uh, some representation of the dynamic system. If you're extending the same basically and you're trying to be, you're extending the same and you're trying to use it in uh, okay. yeah, that's yeah. what I will show how I extend it okay. to include physics. So the all of this only defines parameters and structure, but it did it did not define specific physics. Okay, so what they were doing so far is that here Instead of getting the differential equations for the model, they were exchanging only the parameters and a block diagram. So if you talk to, do you know who Chris Paredes is at Georgia Tech? No. So I say he's someone who had quite a lot to do with the formulation of the system now. Yeah. And so there is this ongoing discussion in the community. So they have parametric diagrams, right? Yeah. So you can express parametric relationships. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not they need to extend the language to include differential equations. Yeah. And it seems like it's an unresolved issue at this point. Yeah, and I don't want to do that because that will involve me getting too deep into the standardization process and instead you don't of packet. Yeah, yeah. So this is what we have done to include physics in the in the system. Yes? Um, is that UML or SysML or both? Both. Okay. UML and SysML. 
but uh, well, the CSML part is is really defined. Uh, I can show you the diagram with the use you were case. Using, using the term UML in there, but it looked like there were also some SysML diagrams, and so that's why I was just asking for it's, it's both UML. Oh, so so basically, you get UML in uh, uh, parameters like this is basically just UML. But when you are trying to build topology, then you need system now. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so what, we want, so what I wanted to do is to go from the same model uh, to simulation to applying model transformations. So what we have done is that we have added the physical behavior from a library that we'll present later called OpenIPSL. This library is defined in Modelica with all of the differential equations. So uh, basically we build a meta model from which where we can generate a Modelica model that can be simulated with standard compliance Modelica tools. And the proposed mapping or model transformation method takes the same model for a network, takes the same profiles and the library. We have mapping rules we have population of the map structure, and we build a system meta, meta model that gets instantiated through the process. To do this, of course, it was not easy because I didn't know anything about papyrus or uh, about, we knew very little about these things, so we had to learn. So the environment for uh, UML and SysML that we're using is papyrus. And uh, in Papyrus, we have the definitions of the generator, and we have CSML component diagrams where we can have the references to our Modelica model in three different layers. Okay. So we apply the model transformation, and what that means is that we have to build mapping rules. So here you have a component map, and here you have an attribute map. It's a little bit hard to read here. So what I will do is that I will click escape and zoom in for you guys. All right, there we go. So uh, this is the REF file that we are interfacing with the RFIDs to populate this uh, terminal map. And here we're assigning the values that we need to use there. So, so, from a software standpoint, these rules, how are you implementing these rules? Java. Java is more than Java. Is it Jenna? No, it's just Java because we didn't know any. Yeah. We, we were going to use ATL probably, but right now it's just Java. We're not software engineers. <laughs> so you basically just treat the IDF as a XML file? Uh, well, that's not all of it because this is just one uh, of so Yes, yes. I mean, so that's what she says. Yes, you're treating it as an XML file, right? We're reading the XML file, yeah. We're, we're doing that. Right, but then how do you actually activate the rules? Ah, this, that's coming. Wait. <laughs> so, the mapping rules are used to read the scene values, and these are used to create instances of the library in the meta model. Okay? So, what you can do is that here we have the, the model that we want to use is a generator. And you have the class name and package name as a data type. And here you define the attributes from the same file. Okay? From the from the your file. So we're instantiating our classes. So it's a model-to-model -model transformation. It's not the smartest one. And finally we connect things together. Now how do they get executed? We go to the next diagram. But this why is it changing here? Okay. So I'm just going very briefly to all of these things. Uh, so here we implement all of the mapping rules. Because for each component that you have, you have to have a mapping rule to our library. OK? So we read all of the mapping rules. We create all of the components that you will need for that model with all of their attributes. And here we link them together. How do you know? You know, if I'm a user of the system, I can see it being a major pain. Figuring out, just getting rid of the bugs. The user of the system doesn't have any choice right now. They don't have any tool to do this. They have to buy a tool that does just an internal model. So 
There is no solution. This is the latest thing. Right, 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 right. No, 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 no. I... In our field, this is not been tried. So this is the first step. So essentially, it's a, it's a compiler. That's, that's what it is. No, we're mapping, we're mapping the, 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 the UML model <coughs> with all the attributes. <coughs> and, this, and we generate the CSML diagram. And we generate all in Moelica, but that's still a model. The, the model has not been compiled. No, but a compiler is just a transformation. That's what a compiler is. Yeah, but we're not, no, because we're going from one model representation to another model representation. It's still a compiler. I don't think a compiler is, is a model representation. Everything is a model like her, but not in this case. Well, we, we have to, the compiler, have to the compiler can give me a simulation results. That's a compiler. <laughs> anyway, so you end that up here. With this is a CSML diagram that has all of the classes instantiated, and basically we write this out to a modeling command. So this is how it looks like when it's automated. At the end, you read all the rules and you parse the model out and you generate it here. Uh, and this is the file that connects all of the components that have been instantiated here. And with that, you can run a simulation with any modeling tool. So that's the, the first new thing that we have done. Uh, uh, before, before continuing, I, I think uh, I have to check the time. Because I, so uh, I only talked about <laughs> I have too many slides. I don't know how much more time you want to give you. I mean, you have 10 minutes. Just let me stop. Uh, I can move to all to other topics. Uh, Adaptively. So, just one question. So, there was no sync to Modelica, let's say, that or translator of any form? No, it doesn't exist for power systems. For power systems, yeah. Because we have these specialized profiles. Mm -hmm. So, we, we built the. This is not even published. Yeah, yeah. So, we're quite finishing the paper to do this. Actually, Modelica was not even a part of the standard. I made it a part of the standard. So, what are your impressions of Modelica? I will talk about that right now. Okay, fine. So uh, this is a very interesting graph of, from the, uh, I think it's uh, from Germany. I know it's BDC research, that's another one. On how uh, we're moving from standardized languages to proprietary, sorry. We're moving from proprietary languages to standardized languages. Uh, that's a very generic graph that I use to show how it's becoming more important that you share the same language to be able to maintain it the long term. So Modelica is standardized by the Modelica Association, but it's also open. Most of the standards that I know are not open, and that's a huge problem. Okay, So that's an important uh, thing. Uh, open IPSL is for library, and it's for power systems for one particular type of modeling approach that is called phaser. Okay, is the phaser modeling approach. This is not three phases with the R, L, the L, and the C that are frequency dependent. This is called phaser modeling and is used for modeling large interconnected networks. Here we preserve the electromechanical behavior of the interconnected system. Okay? And what we have done is to uh, limit user uh, res resistance we have validated the models against reference tools that the engineers use. So we're taking advantage of unambiguous model exchange because now we can move our model between five different tools, whereas in the past you have to re-implement it entirely in another tool. Uh, we have a formal mathematical description of the models because it's, you write the equations, basically. Uh, we can use object orientation, which is not very common. And we separate the models from the independent development environment and the solvers. And this is critical because in electrical power, all of the tools have um, implicit integration. So the model is inside of the solver. That's all of the power system tools do it. Okay? Which means that a model represented in tool A cannot be the same as in tool B. And that has many uh, important issues with arbitration. 
Uh, so the library looks like this. At the top layer, you have all of these components. So if you go inside to machines, and then you go look into uh, PSSC, is the reference tool. It's a tool developed in the US. And we compare one to one the models, I will show you how. And uh, so here's the electrical generators. And these are uh, power system stabilizers that you use on them. Here are some wind turbines. So if you look inside of the wind turbine, and you open uh, this model, I think it is, you will see the block diagram. And inside of that block diagram, you can look at another control system. And the important thing is that this type of uh, protections that you have defined there with uh, LC sort of uh, triggers are written out, specifically how they're uh, supposed to behave. Whereas when you look at the standard, what you have is a block diagram not the equation that we need to implement. So this was the contribution that we managed to do. Uh, how, if you open the library, you will see that you have this uh, diagram view. And inside of it, you will see all of the instantiation of the parameters, the class, sorry, the declaration of parameters, instantiation of classes, and all the connect commands. And there are many applications examples uh, that we have developed for a time. A typical question that I get is, uh, can you simulate a large network? And for that, we have modeled an equivalent of the Nordic electrical grid, which we have matched to the market dispatch data that we have. So we have matched the steady state, and we are able to run simulations of that. Uh, this was done together with the Norwegian transmission operator. And this is how it looks in, in, in Modelica. But you can see that we have different of the bidding zones that they have. Nordic electricity market. Um, uh, here is a comparison between the power system tool and um, Modelica tool. And these are the errors that we get for this. So we were, for a large model like this, it's very hard to get a match like this. So we have done a very careful job. Uh, the library has a continuous integration um, development framework. What do we use? Yeah, it's here. It's what I'm going to say. <laughs> so we use uh, the GitHub platform together with Travis platform for continuous integration. It's, it's, yeah. You cannot see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, I'm having trouble seeing myself, so that's why I'm going back and forth. It's a little bit too small. Maybe I should be nice to everybody. have the library repository and when you submit a new model uh, you will trigger a, a check so the checks that we do is a syntax check of the language and we do regression testing for a, a subset of models um, yeah and uh, the technology that we use is basically docker so in, we have a docker image that has ubuntu open modelica and python and uh, you get, using this, the references from an FTP service, basically a, a, a computer in your lab. And uh, we pull the image and we execute. If you pass the tests, you go back here and give you a message allowing you or disallowing you to submit your change to the model. And we do this because it's, uh, made, we used to have a lot of developers or students and it was a mess. It was out of necessity, again. Uh, so you have the developer, the Modelica model, and you have the results from the reference model from another tool or measurements if you had them. Uh, you perform model check. If you pass, then you go to the, <laughs> so you simulate the model, and you compare with the reference, and you compute a metric, for example, a norm two. You can get very fancy with that also. And then you go and uh, check if you passed or not. And you continue. Here is an example of a model that was not uh, working correctly. So you compare the reference waveform with the simulation results. So we pass the check of the syntax, but is not having the expected physical behavior. And you get a message uh, that 
yeah, you make a mistake, you can commit. And uh, in this case, you get a, a, a message that you can commit. So, as far as I know, we're the only tool that has that. The next tool that I want to show you, and while I'm going through every of these examples, you should keep uh, a look at here on top. That will show you what areas of the model based design framework I'm trying to cover. I forgot to mention that, sorry. So what we built is, uh, uh, we have all of our models, but in the project we had the, uh, the requirement of being able to uh, validate against field, okay? And so what we built is, uh, I wanted to build a tool to solve different system identification problems, not just for a specific power pool. So this is what RAPID is, and it's a recursive acronym, so it's called RAPID Parameter Identification, is RAPID. So. Um, it's extensible, so the architecture allows us to use any uh, optimizer or any solver that has a link with MATLAB basically as, a, as the integration group. And the common example is that we have the reference measurements and we want to match the simulation to the, me to the measurements and basically we try to optimize the parameters. Here is a picture of the old GUI that we have. So what's nice of Rapid is that we are, what we are using here is that we are using a standard called the FMI standard for model exchange. So we are able to generate uh, uh, an FMU, a fl flexible mock-up unit that complies with that standard and we're able to take our Modelica model in an FMU and put it inside of SQL. And in SQL we build all of the infrastructure to calibrate the model. So that's the, the interesting and powerful thing of this approach because many people have built things like this but the possibility now is that we can move our model from one platform, we can just run our code in different five Modelica tools, but we can bring it in here to calibrate against the measurements. So here's an example from uh, a Norwegian plant uh, where we are basically calibrating 25 parameters uh, of one of these uh, generators. So uh, here you have the, the voltage at the bus here, and this is the angle. If you have less parameters, you've got a better result, but 25 is pretty much a lot for this case. So MATLAB acts as a wrapper, and you can use a GUI or a script, and we have a plugin ar architecture. So we have uh, different solvers and so on, provided in MATLAB, but we have implemented some very simple particle swarm, some of these algorithms, and we, we can integrate with commercial solvers that have an API with them. So if this works, I hope. Now you can see here the video. I will, uh, do I have time still or should I move? So here are the measurements from a hydro plant in Bosnia. And uh, you apply a typical test in the automatic voltage regulator is that you change the reference and you, have, you want to see if you got the response of the machine that is defined for basically rise time, settle time. And uh, we had no model for that system, so we built it from scratch, from nameplate values of the equipment and just the, uh, the drawings. And uh, what we will try to do is to uh, calibrate the parameters of the excitation system. So the Modelica model is generated into a flexible mock-up unit, and that's put in simile, and rapid wraps around everything to solve the problem. The measurements are also loaded, and of course you have to do a lot of things to the measurement before you use them. So that's another reason that we decided to do it in MATA, although it's a bad idea, I think, because less people can use it without licenses. Uh, so here is the model that we developed for this plant. Uh, in Modelica you click in, and there is a machine, the generator, and there is the excitation control system. Uh, the excitation control system, we input the changes in the input that were applied during the test also in the field. So that's how we create the disturbance. You can also give input data to the program. It was an example where you don't have any input. Uh, you just have output measurements. So that's the FMU compiled. 
and then we just uh, read the, the measurements and we compare with some scopes. And this is completely unnecessary just for a proof of this uh, visualization. Uh, and then you save some stuff to the workspace. So you will have to configure the GUI if you don't like scripts. I prefer the scripts. So you select the measurements, the optimization method, and so on. I will try to move it along. Here is we're using particle swarm. So when it's hard to see with this light, but you, you can trace a little bit here. So the simulations are run automatically every time, and we're just uh, moving the parameters along with the optimization method really fine. Yes, uh, I have more. The final result is shown here below. So basically we remove all of this is very, very low frequency dynamics. We're talking about less than, uh, oh, less than 0.1 hertz. So we remove all of that Gordon behavior. And this is the part of the model that we were trying to capture. So this is another example of where we have this model based engineer. If you want, in the slides, there is the links. This is all available open source. And there is some papers that document. They're published in the software extern of this new. I like that very much. So uh, one advanced way I've made is the following is that now, well, My name is Michael Wenter and I work at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the Building Technology and Urban Systems Department. And there I lead a team that develops uh, new generation computing tools for building and community energy grids. So Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is one of the US Department of Energy Research Lab. And we do uh, unclassified research across a variety of disciplines, so range, ranging from energy applications to mathematics, physics, uh, computer science, and there are about 4,000 uh, researchers at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Some of them have joint appointment with UC Berkeley, and we also produced a uh, number of Nobel Prizes. The open standards like uh, modeling and FMI are important because you basically ah, don't I depend on one particular vendor at the end, so we really get an open ecosystem it's where you. It's for me that YouTube can play. <laughs> Well, that's the first one. Anyway, uh, Modelica is now included in the standard for, uh, together with UML system as part of it. And now they're starting to test with very simple models that we have made for them. So now, the rest of the talk, I think we won't have time because I've stopped too much. But uh, you can see now that there's a huge roadblock because the models that we have in Modelica cannot be uh, uh, as to other tools. So actually SIM also doesn't let you do this type of transformations right now. What you would need to have a real-time simulation. Okay. Uh, and the Modelica models cannot be used for real time because uh, we basically need to uh, have a, a target that is able to support the compiled codes from that without paying huge amounts of money to that's all. Uh, so what, uh, this is uh, a reference model that we have developed to perform real-time simulation. It contains transmission, medium voltage, and distribution. And it runs on 11 processors on an Opal uh, NLC simulator. And there's two versions of it in recent papers. So try to move along. You can get it also from GitHub from our account. The lab that I run, we have developed it over several years. But basically, we have the real-time simulator connected to the substation automation equipment, either with uh, physical signals or through different protocols. And we have here a, a managed switch. And we have a data concentrator. These are all default things from the field. Uh, where we have done most of the software is to develop real-time mediation uh, uh, toolkits for application uh, development and control systems. And uh, it looks like this is just a few racks with the equipment and some places to sit. So this is the typical, uh, well, this is our testing and validation lab, let's call it like that. How we work is that we have a model. We put uh, different sensors, either this 
units that are for substations or uh, compact rios configured with the same functionality. We talk to the phaser data constructor with the same protocol. And then with this, uh, S3DK is our library. We implement an application. This is a simple application that allows you to visualize the, the voltage magnitudes and phasers across the grid. So uh, once we put the model in, we go through this workflow and we iteratively do the, the design of the implementation of the application. Here is a different application that we have implemented. This is just a dedicated monitoring panel for the Norwegian company that we built. The same in iPad and iPhone. This is a, a call it vibrations, I think, but it's a oscillation that go across a very large network. You can identify it with different signal processing methods. So we have implemented this sort of application, so it allows you to detect the eigenvalue, the damping, and the frequency. This is for uh, forced vibrations in the system. Uh, it's a typical case with wind turbine controls that enter in resonance with the grid. So we have uh, done that. And other, uh, it's a Lapunov-based uh, stability calculator uh, monitoring tool. Uh, the, an example of these applications in more deep, in, in illustrative approach is that you have a distribution network and a transmission network, and you have two measurement devices in each location. So you want to figure out uh, which one is producing instability. So basically, when you don't have the wind farm connected, you have this bifurcation curve as a function of the load, and you're operating right there. And what we tested in the lab is that connecting the wind. So uh, this part provides the whole system stability, and your margin from that is calculated to the curve. Uh, but you can uh, divide the contributions of each part of the network, so the distribution network has the strongest effect in this case. Now when you connect the, the wind generator, your margins increase, and that's a very simple physics, is because you can regulate the voltage at both ends of this corridor, allowing more power to flow. So this is a simple tool that we built, the control systems. We started by looking at typical uh, stabilizers and voltage, uh, automatic voltage controls, and we linked them together with the, the power system and a model, and um, what we basically wanted to do was develop a power system stabilizer that has the same functionality as what you can get in the field, plus being able to provide additional functions. It, we need to convince them that this will work as good as what they can get in the field, but even better now. So uh, we developed the models on Simulink, and then we uh, tested the models that are inside here and the ones in the software to develop a new phaser uh, oscillation damping control system. Uh, this control system was then implemented in the hardware. We wanted to uh, implement a very nice design, which was here. So we wanted to run different functions in the real-time controller because the measurements are only arriving every 10 milliseconds. So we thought that we could do well enough with uh, 10 milliseconds loop, but this was not possible. So we had to modify the architecture and modify it again because there were no protocols that we could run in the real-time controllers at that time. So the final design that you have here runs a data mediator outside on an external computer. It publishes data to the real-time controller and the control functions are implemented in an FPGA where we generate the data. So it has three layers uh, of, uh, in the control. Okay. And there you can get a screenshot. So we take the, measure, the measurements from the simulator, we pass it through all the instruments, the concentrator, and the computer, all the way to FPGA, and we feed them back into the control. Uh, he, the same control was extended now to uh, provide some sort of bang-bang uh, approach to control an industrial load, uh, aluminum smelter that you can turn on and off. This was done for the Icelandic operator. 
Uh, and here we also analyze the different uh, observability properties of different sigma. So we show which signals are better to use in this case for the observability. And this show you results for software in the loop using angle differences across the whole Iceland in this case. And the hardware in the loop uh, with this uh, same architecture. So we just modify a part of the controller with a very simple logic. Now the biggest problem for this part is that we, every time that we go from this workflow here, we have to completely re-implement everything on the other platform. So there is no way of transforming all the models to use it with the hardware that you have. So we have to redo the job twice, usually. So this is a huge barrier, uh, how to do this, I don't know. That's why I hope John solves Now the uh, we went a little step further. This was the control uh, uh, architecture that I showed you. Okay, so you have here uh, parsing of the protocol. Here you have the real-time processor that manages signals. And here you have the control one. We implemented uh, the code now to replace this part. And we have a real-time mediator that runs the processor using the standard protocols that the devices are communicating. And now we keep that part. So everything is converted and realized in the control system. When you test it with this uh, simple test model, you're going to control the, sorry, you're going to perturb the system here, and you're going to modulate it with this load. OK? You have software in the loop, hardware in the loop, with the two different mediators. So the green one and the red one are closer together than the blue one. You also can see the increase of damping performance that we have because the time delay that it builds up in the control ar uh, architecture between the parsing and the resending in the original case is too large. And this is really a big problem when you try to do it in the, in the field, which is only a few countries have tried, China and Norway. So this was another uh, thing. Uh, we have all of these tools. Almost all of them are now available open source. So you have a simple parser that uses Labio and C++ over ActiveX. You have the S3DK toolkit. Here you have a drag and drop sort of approaching Labio uh, to be able to implement applications. Unfortunately, these do not run on embedded computers. So for that, we have a Labio only version that is only uh, it's only in Labio. So that's that's why it's not so useful, uh, that wrap, unwraps the communication protocols. And here we have a gateway implemented in C uh, that provides these different functionalities. Uh, they are all in these repositories, and we are preparing the last one so other people can use it. Some papers where the software is. The last uh, technical thing that I think is interesting is about joint modeling and simulation. So you saw that we did the system level part on its own, and then my, the last results in the lab is where I spend most of my time. That's on its own. There's no glue between them. But what is worried that is there's no glue with the other domains even. So there's very, uh, I think there's a, a need to do joint integrated modeling, not only for simulation, but integrated modeling of the domains. Com, time, and the power system. Uh, and basically, for all the communication network, you have to go through all this process. And yeah, so this is the biggest challenge I can see. And ver uh, verification and validation turns out to be very important in the context of time. So there's, it's a very important thing right now in the U.S. They just had a workshop in NIST last week that I was watching online about time and electrical grids. And the problem is that you can actually have an unwanted impact on the monitoring, control, or protection applications. So we use the lab and oral tools to demonstrate these problems with actual experiments and applications. So if you just jam the signal, you lose the GPS signal, you will end up having a very huge error in the power transfer. And this is the key monitoring application. But what is more interesting is the effect of destabilizing the controls. So here we again use this control system and we simulate it. Uh, but 
taking away the GPS signal. So the problem is that this equipment that we have have internal plugs that drift. And when you lose the signal, you get a drifting plug. I'm not showing you here the next step that was corruption. So we have generated a pretty big code generator inside of our simulator that we fit in where we can manipulate the time intentionally and basically corrupt intentionally with the GPS data because it's illegal to do GPS experiments and we did it with EDP code. And also most of the instruments use EDP actually for a substation distribution. I, do, I think I have to stop. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, but what I wanted to show you was how this different parts and uh, go through the model based design approach and there's many useful things that can be used from, from the approach. Thank you very much. Welcome.